An average Canadian homeowner will make over 80 mortgage-related decisions throughout their lifetime, and all these decisions can affect how they live their daily lives. From making sure they choose the right lender, to deciding on the right term, type and rate, mortgage-related decisions can have a tremendous impact, so making the right decisions can really count. That's why when mortgage customers are faced with having to make important mortgage decisions, they turn to mortgage brokers. Mortgage brokers offer expertise and advice, so mortgage customers can be more informed. But mortgage brokers also do a lot more. They offer their customers a one-stop shop for great rates and value-added mortgage features from their partners like First National. Mortgage brokers are also licensed and regulated professionals who have the credibility to help customers find the right mortgage, even when new mortgage rules are introduced. Mortgage brokers offer personalized service, so customers don't have to get bogged down in paperwork or feel uneasy about the status of their application. They work with partners like First National, who are also dedicated to keeping the customer experience positive and seamless. This year and in the years to come, many Canadians will be faced with having to make mortgage decisions that will affect their daily lives. They can count on mortgage brokers and their partners to help. Hey friends, good uh, morning to those of you in the West, good afternoon to those of you in the East. It is Gary Morris from the DLC Group of Companies head office, April 12th, 2022. Super excited about today's uh, program, have a, an extraordinary guest that I think is going to uh, be just a delight to interview for all of you. Uh, my guest today is Greg Westlake. Greg Westlake is one of Canada's most prolific para hockey players. He's a five-time Paralympian. Greg has also made Team Canada his Team Canada uh, debut in 2003 at the age of 15. He hasn't looked back, capturing four Paralympic medals, including gold in Torino in 2006 and silver most recently in the Beijing Games 2022. He served as captain of the national team from 2010 to 2018. Greg currently sits second in all-time points and third in Paralympic scoring. Greg has just returned from competing in the Beijing 2022 Games, where the team earned a silver medal. Greg was also the flag bearer for Canada at the 2022 Games. Greg is going to set his sights on the broadcast studio after he's accomplished all he has and all his on-ice goals. He's uh, made appearances on CBC covering the 2015 Para Pan Am Games and the 2016 Paralympic Games. If that wasn't enough, Greg is also has seven world championships, two gold medals, three silvers, and two bronzes. Greg, you're in uh, Burlington, Ontario today. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Greg, I've heard so much about you. Obviously, uh, your brother, uh, Scott, is, uh, is part of our group at Dominion Lane Centers, one of our franchise owners. I know he's extraordinarily proud of his little brother, but... Until I started doing my homework on you, Greg, I mean, I got to tell you, uh, I, I've been absolutely blown away by just some of the things that you've achieved, and we're extraordinarily happy to have you here today. Uh, thank you so much. It's uh, it's actually shocking I'm not a broker, because I feel like I uh, I chased my brother around my whole life, and you know he, he's one of the main reasons why I'm a, a hockey player to this day and in the position I'm in, so uh, you know, I really appreciate all he's done for me my whole life. Yeah, he's actually uh, he's actually one of my dear friends and someone I really appreciate. I mean, it's funny, though, because you come from a very entrepreneurial background, right? I mean, obviously, you know, a lot of you um, listening today or watching this don't know this, but uh, Greg's father was was uh, a very senior position at RBC for many years. Uh, he was in charge of retail, commercial and wealth management at RBC before, uh, you know, uh, going into uh, banking internationally. He's since retired. But uh, you certainly have, uh, you know, some very good DNA in your family. So we're yeah. uh, we're thrilled to 
Yeah, yeah. Some, some amazing role models. And, you know, I, I think so much in life is just who you surround yourself with and the, and the team that you have around you. And from such a young age, my sisters as well are, are, are both super accomplished. And I'm very lucky to be the youngest of four kids and, and have them as my siblings. I really am. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, during today's uh, broadcast, we're going to give away 50 copies of your favorite book. And your favorite book is called 11 Rings. And of course, it's the uh, story from Phil Jackson. So if you're on this call today, guys, and you want to put a comment up or you want to, you know, give a shout out to Greg or you have any questions, please do. Uh, we're going to drop in those comments and send 50 books. I haven't actually read this book, but I just uh, read sort of uh, the foreword here this morning um, because I want to read it. And it sounds like an extraordinary book. Tell me about why that book, 11 Rings. Well, you know, it signifies 11 championships, why it meant something for you. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, first off, there's some recency bias. It's the last book I read, but for me, it really marries the high performance sports world along with kind of the mindfulness meditation world. And, and Phil Jackson was known as the Zen master. And back in the 80s, when he was coaching Michael Jordan all the way up till he coached Kobe Bryant in the 90s, he was one of the first coaches to have these guys sit on the board after hard practice, close their eyes and just meditate and, and, and really be present in the moment. And so he did all these things. So I tell people that 11 Rings is, is like a sports performance book, met Matthew McConaughey's Green Lights. And it introduces you to a lot of different concepts. You, you know, Phil Jackson loved to travel. He's very well cultured. He's very well read. Uh, and he introduces you to a lot of great concepts, uh, one of them being, you know, you know an African pro proverb called Ubuntu. And what that means is I am because we are. And it, it just means that, you know, in, in a team setting, we all rely on each other for success. And so many coaches now moving forward have taken a lot of these uh, rituals and things that Phil Jackson introduced and, and have been successful with them. Doc Rivers, um, when the Celtics won championship in 2008, uh, took this in boot two mindset because he thought they had too much leadership on their team and they needed some guys to sacrifice a little bit and to buy into team ideals. So there's something in it for everybody and I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, that's uh, really cool. I'm looking forward to uh, to reading that. So Greg, let's kind of jump back from early days, the beginning. Let's give everyone sort of a snapshot. So uh, you're the youngest of uh, four kids in the family. Uh, so tell us, you were born um, obviously with some difficulties. And when you're 18 months old, your parents had to make a very hard decision uh, to amputate both your legs. Um, you know, what do you remember, obviously, years later, but uh, what can you tell us about those days? I mean, those must have made, must have been incredible decisions made from mom and dad at such an early age, because I guess the choice was to to let you have sort of stumps and, and, and not have any mobility growing up, or at least give you a chance with prosthetics which I believe at that point uh, and that, you know, in that year, we're still very underdeveloped and, and not really good. Right. Like I would say technology has come. Away. I definitely get around better now than I, than I did when I was three. Um, but no, I was, I was born with feet. They just weren't fully developed and they were never going to be, they were missing bones. They were twisted backwards. And it, it wasn't as stressful as a decision as I think it may come across. I, I believe the doctor told my parents that, if you do choose to amputate, which is obviously scary for, for young parents, uh, this will give your son the best chance at, at living a normal life and, and run and play like other kids and, and do the things that other people his age are doing. So uh, I don't think they hesitated very much. They, they just said, you know, yeah, we, we accept that decision. Uh, and it was off to the races. And kind of like we touched on earlier, being the youngest of four kids was actually really helpful just on a physical development side because – when you're a young child dealing with some difficulties like I was with adjusting to life on two prosthetic legs and, and learning how to do all the things that you want to do, maybe in a different way, um, I just chased my siblings around. I didn't know anything different. As a kid, you're so happy. So I think in those early developmental years, it, it's harder on your family. It's harder on your parents because it, it's the unknown. And I remember my grandma cut out an article from the uh, local uh, newspaper and mailed it to my mom. And it was about a young man who had the exact same disability that I had, but he was 15 years older than me. And he was playing rep baseball in the P in Ottawa. And I remember my mom getting that, that newspaper clipping and just being so happy and optimistic that, okay, well, if that guy can do it, maybe my son can, can grow up and, and live a pretty normal life as well. So, you know, all those things that, that people do, reaching out to people in tough situations, they go a long way. They help a lot more than people think. And uh, I'm just very lucky and, and fortunate that they had the 
the guts to make that decision. And then obviously they've stuck with me and supported me every step of the way. Ever since. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No kidding. So Greg, uh, growing up, you know, sort of through elementary school and high school, uh, was a challenge you dealt with being a disabled, uh, you know, youth. Did you, did you get picked on a law? Did you, was everyone fairly supportive? I mean, what was that like, uh, you know, being different? You, you know what? Fairly supportive. I, you know, I had a big, tough older brother there, but, uh, you know, for me, it was the mental um, side that was really hard for me because in my mind, I really wanted to be the first NHL player on two artificial legs. In my mind, I wanted to do rep hockey. I wanted to do all these things that were just physically a little too hard for me. And so there's frustration there when you're working so hard, you're trying your absolute best and you just you can't get there. And so for me, it was more just those types of, of dark days of, of realizing that maybe some of those goals and ambitions you have might not play out. And so it's, it's how do you deal with that rejection, that failure, th th those things that, that really shape who you become as you age and get older. But for me, no, it, it wasn't a hard thing in terms of being picked on or anything like that. I was always around great people and supportive people. For me, it was just the, the dealing with having to pivot what your goals and, and, and ambitions are. Mm -hmm. So you played, uh, obviously you played uh, able-bodied hockey on your uh, two prosthetics. Uh, and you played that right up to, to um, when you're around 15, I think. Were you playing some other sports as well? Yeah, you know, I grew up doing everything. And I, some of my other loves were I actually loved like jujitsu and kickboxing. And I was an aggressive little kid. So if I could play hockey or, or you know, do jujitsu competitions or stuff like that, wrestling, I, I loved all that stuff. I played baseball as well. I played volleyball for my school. Um, really anything I could get my hands on. You, you know, you had to to tire me out to, to get me to calm down at home. So I was – one of those guys that always needed to be in some sort of recreational sport uh, all the time. So then walk us through it. You uh, obviously you became, you know, arguably the best uh, sledge hockey player in the world. Uh, you know, sort of 19 years was your career. Just finished uh, Beijing um, 2022 with a silver medal. You're 15 now. You're realizing there's some, you know, you can't get to where you want to go sort of, uh, you know, you're never going to make the NHL. And one day, you know, you just said, let's, let's show up at the sledge hockey uh, rink. I mean, how did, how did that, how did that happen? Yeah. You know, again, I got to give my parents a ton of credit. They, uh, they know how important sports, they know how important being an athlete and just competition. They, they know how important that is to me. And they came to me one day and said, Hey, like if, if being an athlete is something that you want to do and is so important to you, there's probably a way you can do it, but it's going to be different than you first thought. It's not going to be in the NHL. And they said, have you ever heard of sledge hockey? And at that time, you know, this is a, a niche sport with not a lot of people playing. Not many people know what it is. It's not that popular worldwide. And I went to the rink and I watched it. And it took me meeting some people that were in the sport and meeting some amazing athletes with disabilities to convince me to get involved. Because I didn't want to play an adaptive sport. I didn't want to go into the whole Paralympic realm. And, you know, fast forward, we can get into that. I'm so happy I did. It's had such a profound impact on my life. But when you're 15, 16 years old, you just want to hang out with your friends. You're not thinking, you know, maybe that far ahead. So thankfully, my parents were and they introduced it to me. And, you know, and I went out and the first time I tried it, I hated it because I sucked. You know, yeah. and, and what you realize really quickly is just how special some of these athletes with disabilities are. And I saw the shape that some of these guys were in, how fit they were, how hard they could shoot the puck, how physically demanding the game was. And once I realized what a challenge that would be, you know, it's not easy. It's not charity. It's competition, but it puts me on a level playing field. I'm playing with people who are in the same boat as me. So that really excited me because now for the first time in my life, I'm not the underdog. I'm not the person that has to go out there against all odds and, and try to compete. So that was really attractive to me. And so I kept working at it, kept working at it. And, uh, you know, here we are today. Yeah, and how long, uh, I mean, obviously you worked your way all the way through and, and you got better, you progressed and progressed. And uh, was it 2000, what year is it you became captain? 2003? 2010, 2011. 2011, you were captain, okay. Yeah. And so what was that like? I mean, you went from a from a, a new player to becoming, you know, captain of, uh, of, you know, one of the most successful sort of, you know, sledge teams in the world for years and years. What did you learn from becoming the captain? Oh, so much. I mean, first off, it's just such an honor because I wasn't even thinking about being a captain of a sledge hockey team or, or, or a Paralympic program. I was just thinking about Hockey Canada and, and, and so much of my 
hockey heroes have just worn that maple leaf on their chest, you, you know, and, you know, some of my favorite hockey memories growing up were the 2002 Salt Lake city Olympics when the men's team won gold and the women's team won gold. And, you know, watching Mario Lemieux, you know, no look assist in that gold medal game was incredible. And so for me, just to, to have that C on my Jersey and now have access to, to that much coaching and that much help on leadership um, really helped me. So I, uh, there are so many tools, um, I think for me, the three things when it comes to just leadership, you know, th there's always the basic stuff of, of, you know, show up early, leave late, work hard. There's all those things. Don't ask somebody to do something you wouldn't do. And those are all true. Um, but I think the first thing is just passion. You know, I think the reason that I got the captaincy and what got my foot in the door to begin with was just my love of the game. I I'm such a fan of of the sport. I've been a fan since I could, you know, from the second I could walk and talk, I was holding a hockey stick. Um, and you can't fake passion. People know when you're into something and when you're not. So I think if, if you're genuinely passionate, that will show through and, and be a great uh, part of leadership. I think you have to think bigger than yourself. I think you can't just think what's good for me. It has to be what's good for everybody. And so for me at the time when I got captaincy, our sport still was really unknown. And, and so for me, I had to travel. I had to do as much media as possible. I had to go to schools and do speaking engagements. It, it was just saying yes to everything so we could put ourselves on the map, so we could grow the game for more people. Because if we get exposure, kids in hospitals and, and people going through hard times who don't know that this adaptive sport exists will see it, and they won't think life's over. They will know that they have more to strive for and, and that there's stuff out there for them to do competitively. So if you think bigger than yourself, there's Maddox, an amazing kid I met at Holland Blurview Hospital. Um, awesome guy. Uh, and then the, the final thing I'd say for leadership, uh, and again, thanks to Hockey Canada, they've been incredible. They've put me in touch with amazing leaders and, and role models and, and mentors to me. And, and one guy I got the chance to talk to is my favorite player of all time, Jerome McGinla. And he, he just talked to me about the importance of inclusiveness. Don't leave anybody out. And, and he just said, you know, if you're good, it sounds like such a simple thing, but if you're going for a dinner, don't take your two or three guys that you have most on the team. And invite somebody who you don't know very well. Invite everybody, but don't let anybody feel left out or excluded. And if you do that, you can build a tight, well-knit team. And so, yeah, I just think passion, thinking, thinking about more than yourself and being inclusive. Those would be three things that have really helped me in my career uh, from, a, from a sports performance standpoint. Yeah, absolutely incredible advice. Uh, I mean, so meaningful. So, just I want to I want to obviously stay in hockey in, in there, but I want to I just something jumped out at me that I I thought was really interesting, and I want you to explain this to me. I mean, how does this happen? In 2011, you set a land speed record for the fastest arm propelled vehicle. Yes, you see, because I say yes to everything. Like I said, <laughs> you, you got to put yourself out there, right? And so I was doing hospital visits at Holland Blurview, and I was meeting the kids like that picture you just saw. And two of the prosthetics there who are, who are brilliant engineers, they had built this aerodynamic, amazing bike for a hand-propelled vehicle. So you're inside a little bubble, and you're using your hands to, to crank it, so you got to be pretty strong to do it. And they built it for a downhill skier, actually, who was a, who was a Paralympic downhill skier, and he was a double-leg amputee. And about a month before the competition, he got injured skiing and couldn't do it. And so they got my name somehow just because they had seen me around the hospital. So they got my contact information and got in touch with me and just said, hey, like, do you have any desire to come to uh, this small town like four hours north of Reno in Nevada? And it's the longest, flattest, smoothest piece of land in North America. And they said, our guy got injured and fell out. Are you willing to do it? And so I said, absolutely. Sign me up. Send me a plane ticket. I'll be there. And uh, so, so we went out there and we got to work on it. I ended up going back, uh, I think, three times up, up to it's called Battle Mountain, Nevada. And it's an absolute thrill, you, you know, because there's no speedometer in, inside that that vehicle. So you start pushing it, you know, those in the middle of the road. At first, you can see them perfectly clear. And then all of a sudden they become a blur and that's how you know you're going pretty fast. And so, yeah, we ended up setting the land speed record for fastest arm propelled vehicle. And it's a, uh, it was a terrifying experience. It was a fun experience and it, it's probably one I'll never do again. Wow. Absolutely incredible. Just, uh, I mean, wow. Just, just, the, I love it. It's interesting. Cause if I can show you my wall right now, I'm looking at it on my wall, in my office, actually I'm going to oh, really? spin it really quickly just to show it to you. 
you'll see that sign. Yes. Yeah. Right. And I put that sign on my wall the day we started Dominion Lending Centers in, in 2006, uh, actually December, 2005, there was a sign shop next door. And I said, you know what, you have to get good at saying yes. Right. Because when you say yes, you see opportunities that you never, ever thought were possible, even when you can't do them. And you just gave us a, a an extraordinary example of saying yes. And, you know, like what an accomplishment, just amazing. So Greg, talk to me about, um, mentors did you grow up having mentors anyone you really looked up to uh and if so how important do you think mentors are to someone starting out well i, I think it's invaluable you know and the, and the stats and the numbers show that coaching's good and, and coaching's not just good for when you're a child and, and when you're growing up coaching's great for your whole life but yeah i still work with a sports psychologist right now i still have coaches and mentors in my life that help me all the time um, but when I was younger, you know, we touched on the family side, you know, my, my, my parents, my siblings played an invaluable role for me. Um, and then even just my local minor hockey coaches were incredible because of, you know, like I touched on earlier, they were just so inclusive and they encouraged me to go get outside of my comfort zone and, and play able-bodied sports and test myself against other kids. And, you know, I feel bad for so many people that get told no, you know, because, we shouldn't be doing that to anyone, especially children and, and young people. And, and I didn't have that experience a lot. You know, I mostly got yeses and I mostly got, hey, go try it. And so I, I have so much love and admiration for the the minor hockey coaches that, that had me as a kid growing up that, that encouraged me to get out there and compete and try and, and test myself. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Um, and then moving into kind of my Team Canada days, that's the best thing that they did for me was it just opened up the resources. You know, it gave me high performance coaching on demand and I've used it, you know, because you, you can give everyone all the tools to be successful, but at the end of the day, you have to use it. And some of the coaches I've, I've had uh, actually a, a BC guy, Mike Mondin, he's in trail, trail British Columbia. He was the first coach to, to name me captain and really work with me and mentor me and, and tell me stories about leadership and, and just, just be a sounding board. You know, sometimes coaching doesn't have to be every single tool for success. Sometimes coaching is just lending an ear, letting somebody be vulnerable without judgment. Um, those are all things that you need to do to, to help, you know, build success. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, so true. Right. I mean, just, you know, just letting somebody know that you think it's possible and you believe in them and, you know, we sort of know as the number one, you know, used word in the, in the English language in the world, and we, you know, so many people just get sort of where they default to no, that's challenging, that's going to be hard, but to actually default to yes, right? And and give these young individuals and these young people in life, and in some cases, athletes, you know, give them hope that, hey, maybe it is possible, is, is you know, is so powerful, absolutely incredible. So talk to me about, um, about your first gold medal. I was talking to your bro and your bro said to me, it was crazy because my brother is now into sledge hockey. We're going to the first Olympics. As you said, it's my entire family's there. Um, he said, we're super excited about it. And we won the gold medal. And he said, my, he said, uh, he said, Gary, I looked at my family and I said, man, this is cool. We're going to win this gold medal every single year. Like our team is extraordinary. And here we are 17 years later, still in search of the next gold medal. Right? <laughs> it's just, you know, he was just so positive that, you know, this was it. Tell us about, you know, what, how difficult it is. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a great point because I felt that way as well. You know, I, I remember we won that in 2006. And first off, that, that's still to this day my favorite hockey moment. And I know I was just 18 at the time, but my whole family was there. And at that time, when you, when you grow up as somebody with a disability, you have a very special bond to the people that help you. And when we were able to win gold in 2006, I remember I spotted my mom up in the crowd and I had the flowers that they give you. Uh, with, with your medal and I went and found a volunteer and I gave the flowers to the volunteer and pointed my mom out to them and and sent the flowers up to her and then she's crying and she she has them still dried out at, at her home to this day and uh, so you start going to those vulnerable emotional points of all the people that have helped you and to to, to get off the ice and get changed and, and just go give every, all my family members a big hug after a successful game that that was just Nothing will beat that. I, I'm going to be chasing that high for the rest of my life, and I've accepted that. Um, but, no, that was an incredible moment. And, and to your point, success is hard, and especially for us playing hockey and being Canadian, we always have that big bullseye, that big target on our back. And uh, after we started being really successful from about 2000 and 
you know, I'd say about 2005 to about 2009, we went on a really good good run where we were winning everything, world championships, local exhibition games, Paralympic gold medals. We won everything. And then all of a sudden you see other countries are starting to put some money into their program. They're buying better equipment. They're, they're finding ways to find more athletes. They're doing all those, all those things. And if you, if you take your foot off the gas for a second, when it comes to any aspect of a successful team, that's, that's death, you know, complacency is death. Mm -hmm. And, you know, other countries they are recruiting athletes, doing all that work. And it's been hard for us to, to get back to that top of the mountain, at the Paralympic Games. And we've had some some small successes along the way, be it world championships or a game on TSN, which is always great exposure for us. Uh, but through doing those things, you know, I just learned a, an invaluable lesson in, in the importance of keeping the pedal down, uh, you know, not looking in the rearview mirror, just, just constantly pushing ahead. Because to your point, it is hard to stay on top and there's people that are always coming for you. Yeah, such a life lesson. It's it's incredible, right? I mean, they say you are the most vulnerable when you're the most successful because you stop doing the things at the same level. You work so hard to get there and you're relentless and you showed up early and you stayed late and you worked and you ate great and you did whatever you did, right, in order to get there. And same thing in business, right? We talk about it all the time. You know, it's our people who are the most successful who are the biggest targets, number one. And number two, who are the most at risk to, you know, start the downward journey because you stopped doing exactly what you did crazy i want to speak to you about female influence uh i have some notes here um that you actually modeled your career after some female hockey players who who had to fight you know extraordinarily hard also to sort of you know like break through talk to me about that 100 percent. it's uh that's some great research you're doing over there but uh it, it was you know the Haley wickenheisers the cassie campbells of the world um i looked at where the women's program was about 10 years before I came into our program and it was in about the same spot. They were fighting for funding. They were fighting for respect. They were fighting for people to look at them as athletes and not just, you know, as something they did on the side was play hockey. And they pushed and they pushed and, and they said yes to everything. They did the media interviews. They, they played games all over the world. They traveled. They spent time away from their families. And when you look at that and then look at where they are now, you know, there's Haley Wickenheiser, a great Canadian. And, you know, she's head of player development for the Toronto Maple Leafs right now. Cassie Campbell is now, you know, one of the main broadcasters on the CBC doing NHL games every night. And nobody would have thought that was possible 20 years ago. And so I watched their come up. I watched their rise and I mimicked a lot of the stuff that they did. And I thought if it was good for the women's game and I looked at how successful they were becoming, we can steal from that. We can do that model. And so I just started doing basically what they were doing and the rest kind of took care of itself. We started growing. We started getting corporate sponsorships. We started, you know, doing all those things and started being looked at not as charity, but as high performance athletes. Because really that's what we're fighting for. Money's important yeah, and it's nice. But at the end of the day, we wanted respect. We just wanted people to look at us in our sleds on the ice and go, man, those guys work hard. Those guys yeah. are 100% high performance athletes. Yeah. And of course, you've seen it recently in Vancouver. Vancouver has hired the assistant uh, GM. Uh, I think they have two female executives uh, now that have uh, come into Vancouver. So, you know, that that's starting to change and it's so nice to see it. 100%. It's going to open more opportunities for everybody. And that's what's great about the time that we're in right now is, uh, you know, it's never been a, a better time to, to be diverse and include more people. And it, it's fun to play a small, small role in in that success. Yeah, talk to me about sports psychology a little bit, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're sort of down that road now a little bit. So let's just sort of, um, you know, touch on that further. Uh, you know, for all of us, there's negative thoughts that are creeping into our head and we have to get them out of our head and we have to you know, overcome them where we're, our mind is wired to think the worst, you know, every time something is going on in our life. And, you know, we often make the problem so much more difficult, um, you know, as a disabled, you know, uh, or as a, as a, you know, compared to an able body athlete, uh, there must have been lots of times where you were second guessing yourself and you're in, you're, you know, doubting yourself and struggling mentally. How did you deal with that? And can you share any of those experiences? Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, you know, that's probably what we spend the most time doing work on is we spend no time trying to be perfect. No time because nobody's going to be perfect. The perfect hockey game doesn't exist. You can't do it. You can train forever. You will never play the perfect game. So we're not trying to be perfect. We're just trying to be the best version of ourselves. And we work on that every day. And so we work really hard on learning how to reset once we start going down a negative way. 
Um, we use apps on our phone, uh, you know, two that I would recommend. Uh, I'd recommend Headspace. It, it's a fantastic app for mindfulness. Uh, it's more of a meditation app, but it, it's really good. You know, 10 minutes before bed is all, all you need, and it's fantastic. I also have the Calm app on my phone, and it's really good. Same thing. You can use it for meditation, but you can also use it kind of like we're doing right now. They have tons of one-on-ones, coaching sessions, for and, and the variety is incredible. And so the Calm app is something I'd also really recommend. Um, yeah, right there. I think that's fantastic. It's something that I honestly use probably three, four days a week. And I, and when I'm driving as well, I listen to the interviews all the time. It, it's fantastic. Uh, and then there's just all these little triggers that you can kind of implant in your brain. So, you know, one, one rule I use, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard it, is just that that rear view mirror mentality of whether it's 8, 20 or 9, 10, you can't get caught looking behind you. You, you know, if you spend 100% of your time looking in the rear view mirror, you're going to crash your car. And so you can glance up at it, you know, 10%, 20% of the time, take a peek, see what's behind you, where you've been, all the things that you've gone through, but you can't live there. You got to keep looking forward. So, you know, that 80, 90% of the time, check the rearview mirror once in a while, know where you come from, but always go forward. Hey, uh, young man, you're a star. I'm sitting here listening to you right now. You are an absolute born leader. You, I mean, your your parents should be extraordinarily proud. I want to meet your mom and dad. I mean, I can just tell like the, the family that, that they created, the kids, the, you know, the mindset is incredible. So I want to, I want to tell this story. I want to talk about the humble Broncos. They had a serious bus crash, right? Obviously loss, loss of life. And it was just terrible. I mean, it, it brought the nation to its knees and I know you and a couple other uh, uh, players, um, you know, uh, jump into action and went and, and visited, you know, some of the survivors in the hospital. And I, and, and just, and I think, you know, what you did, and please explain this to me much better than I can, but just explaining to them that it's going to be okay. Life is going to, to go on. I have no legs. I have a beautiful wife. I'm going to have children. I golf. By the way, Greg's a nine or 10 handicap, right? Golfer. Yeah, Greg, let's say, golf my let's whole life. Nine. That sounds better than 10. What's that? Nine. Yeah, yeah we'll go with the single. Yeah. Right. So you, you jumped in there and you just, at that point, I mean, these, these young men were, were at their darkest, you know, hours and they were devastated and panicked about what's ahead of them and, you know, tragic morning, you know, of all their teammates. And you're just there to say, Hey, it gets better. Tell us that story. And number, and number two, I want you to, before I forget, thank you for doing things like that. That's incredible. No, thank you. And you know, thanks for having me on to, to share these stories. You know, it's important and, uh, and I appreciate it. So, uh, I mean, first off, I think some of the greatest Canadians that we have are people with disabilities. You, you know, I saw it in the comments about 20 minutes ago, but somebody mentioned that today's the, uh, the anniversary of when Terry Fox started his uh, Marathon of Hope across Canada. Uh, you know, think about Rick Hansen uh, and, and, you know, all the great things that, that he did. Uh, so, you know, those are big, big footsteps, and those are those are giants of, of my industry of people who have who have really set the world on fire and and changed things and made things better for so many people. So that's leadership. That that's incredible, and we're lucky to have them as Canadians. So, you know, I, I think another thing with leadership and all this stuff is is helping others, and that's such an important thing to do. And it was actually um, I remember it was Colby Armstrong and the NHLPA that organized the trip to Humboldt to go see those, uh, the survivors and also the families of people that, that lost ones. And right. so it, it was a, it's not a celebration. It's not something that I feel comfortable sitting here talking about what a great event it was. It wasn't, it, it, it was a tragedy. It was a Canadian tragedy, tragedy. And it, it, it was an honor just to be asked to go share some stories. And, you know, it's a good example of, why sometimes we think so much about performance, you, you know, we haven't won gold since 2006, but I can tell you that when you go meet somebody in a hospital or at their lowest of low, they don't care if it's a gold, silver or bronze. They just see hope. They just see opportunity. Mm -hmm. They, they see something that's bigger than the situation that they're in right now. And it's an amazing thing. So, you know, I took my medals, I took a bunch of team Canada jerseys and just started handing them out to the families. Um, kind of telling them some of my stories and what, what I've been through. And, and, and now two of the players from the Humboldt uh, tragedy that, that have survived and, and fought very hard to gain some normalcy and, and regain their life and power back are, are playing sledge hockey and are actively playing in Alberta right now and, and good players. And it, it's an honor to, to be on the ice with them and, and see 
now what they're going to go do because they're going to do the same thing. They're going to get involved in sport. They're going to use their platform and help more and more people. And it's just going to keep growing like that. So it's an honor to play a very, very small part in, in things like that. Yeah. And it's, um, it's interesting too, because not only Sledgehammer, but Paralympics in general have uh, really begun to sort of rise to prominence and there's some proper funding finally coming. And, you know, it's interesting because you get, you know, in your generation, you get, you know, 17 years in, in the business and, and, you know, very little resources, right? Very little funding for it. I mean, you know, you're not only worried about, you know, uh, playing and representing your country, but you have to worry about, you know, keeping the lights on and paying the bills too. Uh, tell us about those struggles early on and, and if they're getting better now. Yeah, you, you know, it's a great question. They are they are getting better. And again, going back to what I was saying about copying the women, um, a big part of what I was doing for the last 20 years was, was asking for equality. And so if, if I was trying to find a, a corporate sponsorship or, or something like that, um, well, what are you paying your Olympians? Okay, well, let's, let's pay the Paralympians the, the exact same amount because that's the right thing to do. You, you know, and, and, and so we fought really hard and we're still not uh, completely there yet, but we're close. And, and, you know, we're fighting every every day for those little things. But for me, way back in the day, it was just about, you know, not getting too far too quickly. You, you know, I, I couldn't go from nobody knowing who I was, nobody knowing what the sport is to getting spots on Sportsnet and TSN. That wasn't going to happen. So, you know, sometimes you got to start small. You got to do it step by step. And, and for me, I used to do public speeches in, in high schools and elementary schools for $500 a pop. And, and I was doing, you know, most of my young twenties traveling around Canada, just doing those motivational speeches and doing that stuff. And on one hand, I was getting reps as a speaker and that's something that I wanted to do. I was making a little bit of money and I, and I was trying to spread some awareness. So that was great. And, and then it kind of goes from there and just builds and builds. And then slowly you get some media opportunities. I love the media. I think it's free advertisement. I think you should say yes to every opportunity you have to tell your story. Uh, and then I started doing some of that. And then comes some corporate sponsorship. Uh, and, and I'm really proud of the fact that I could go from a pretty relatively unknown sport to doing some spots on Sportsnet, to being sponsored by, you know, Gretzky Estates and, and doing interviews about Wayne and, and, and having those conversations. So, yeah, also some great products there. You got to try those. But, uh, it, you know, I'm very proud of that fact. But, it, it, again, it's not an overnight thing. It's a step-by-step -step process. And we are leaps and bounds ahead of where we were 20 years ago. And now the challenge, like we talked about earlier, is just putting that pile down and, and where can we get, you know, 20 years from now. Yeah, yeah. Um, very interesting. 2010, uh, home field advantage, uh, Olympics here in Vancouver. Uh, how stressful was that being, being, you know, at home, so to speak? Extremely stressful, you know, because you, you remember, we play a sport that's pretty much in complete anonymity. Not a lot of people know what it is. And, and we play a lot of our games overseas. We, you know, at that time before 2010, we played a lot in Germany. We played a lot in Norway. Um, so you just don't get to see us very often. And so I remember that was kind of my first experience of going from playing in front of 15 to 20 people and it's, you know, friends and family to playing in front of 10,000 every single night with live games on CBC that got, I think our first game against Italy got 1.3 million uh, viewers throughout the game. Wow. And so getting all these opportunities and at that time, I'm, I'm still a pretty young guy. It, it was very eye opening. It was very nerve wracking. And, uh, you, you know, we didn't get a great result. And I, I don't know if if nerves played a role. I'm sure they did a, a bit looking back. But at the end of the day, you got to take the good out of it. And, and when I look at Vancouver 2010 to this day, even though we didn't medal there, it was probably the best opportunity we had to gain exposure, uh, to get out and share our stories. And the amount of athletes and people with disabilities I know that are heavily involved in Paralympic sport to this day all say that they got involved because the games were in 2010 uh, in Vancouver. And so if we never had that opportunity to have a hometown games, you know, so many people may never have gotten involved, never got to see the sports and the incredible athletes that play them. And so I'm, I'm still to this day, even though it wasn't our best tournament, uh, very grateful for the opportunity just to, to spread the awareness. Yeah, yeah, that's so uh, that's so cool. Tell us about the uh, torch in the background. The torch in the background. That's from that's also from Vancouver 2010, and uh, yeah. really cool story. There was you know you mentioned my father off the top, and he he's been an active he's been very active in the 
uh, Paralympic world and, and does a lot of great work and helps a lot of people. And so they actually set it up in a way. So uh, I ran the torch in Oakville, uh, where, I, where we grew up, and I actually passed it to my dad. So that there's some incredible photos of me with the torch, lighting his. You know, we give a big high five after I did my run. He takes off on his. Uh, but again, just, you know, as you can tell, it, it, family plays such a big part for for myself and I think all of our family. But uh, that was just another day that I'm so lucky I didn't have to do it alone. I got to share it with people I love and care about. Yeah, I think your dad actually was the uh, head of international. Uh, sorry, he was the, he. I think he was the founder of the the foundation, wasn't he? The Paralympic, uh, Canadian Paralympic Foundation? Uh, no, but he, he was on the board for a while and yeah. uh, and played a big, big role in just helping them uh, grow as a team and, uh, you know, get the resources in the right spots and make sure that the funding is going to the right spot and yeah. just really wanted to help them get organized. So so he did some great work on that. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations to him. That's uh, that's great. Um, so life after hockey. We had Trevor Linden on uh, our last call and nice. uh, talked to Trev about, about finishing – his career when he finished his career and and then you know like those days when he was done and you had said that you're going to retire after this last 2022 have you in fact uh uh come out there and uh, acknowledge retirement at this point and uh if so what is next for you we, we haven't announced it yet uh i will i will be in, in due time you know i want to throw a big party i want to throw a a fundraiser and uh and get some some great people in a room and have uh, one more shot at raising some money for the Canadian Paralympic Committee. So just planning all that out right now and, and we'll go celebrate, you know, 20 years well spent. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, in terms of what's next, uh, you know, like I was saying with the women earlier, they opened so many doors. So, you know, right now I'm having some great conversations with Hockey Canada about staying involved in their high performance programming, uh, some, some with their grassroots programming. Uh, I'm on their board for the uh, Hockey Canada Assist Fund. So I work uh, hand in hand with their board members in raising money for the grassroots sports uh, within Hockey Canada. And then uh, I love this stuff. You, you know, I, I like to be in your shoes interviewing people, Gary. So uh, I'm doing a production company with some guys that I uh, I worked on a show called Level Playing Field with. And we just sold eight, eight episodes to uh, to AMI. So uh, we'll, we'll be uh, setting off in the next two months here to to film eight to 12 episodes of that show. So and talk to us about Level Playing Field and, uh, and what the uh, show's about. Yeah, so it, it's just a show that, that highlights people with, uh, people with disabilities um, or organizations within communities that make a difference in people's lives. And so we've had everything from sports psychologists on to high performance athletes. There, there it is right there. And you know, there's some amazing stories of just high performance. And what I love about this, if you look in the top right corner there, that man is a, uh, He's, he's missing his sight. He's blind and he's just an, and he's a lawyer. Uh, he's just an incredible person. And what you find is there's not just people with disabilities that become great athletes, but there's just high performing people all over. If you look around and, and ask questions and find out more about people. So what, that's what we're trying to do is just share some stories that don't always get told. You know, I'm lucky. I get to come on, on, on your show. I get to go on some other networks and I get to share my story. But there's a lot of people that have done some incredible things that don't have the outlet. So that's what we're trying to create for them. And we're going to create some great content and uh, get it out there. Yeah, that's uh, so much fun. I know you also uh, have a deep love for, for for coaching, player development, scouting. So, I mean, you know, the, probably a young guy like you recently retired. I mean, I hope you see all kinds of opportunities. I mean, maybe you find yourself in, 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 in hockey, you know, as a scout or something. I mean the production uh, piece is, is super exciting. You're so gifted. You're a very, very gifted communicator as well. So I think the future is very bright for you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. So um, who's your role model? Did you, did you, did you have a role model or, or someone that you really looked up to that, you know, that guided you? Yeah. You, you know, I'll try to think away from family because we, we've talked, touched on that a lot, but I really did follow my brother around and that there's little, little stories that stand out. I used to go to his tier two junior hockey games and sometimes I'd play the music up top, but I'd often wait around after the game and my parents would go home and I'd wait and, and have my brother drive me home. And, you know, those drives, we would just talk about the game and what just happened and, and why certain things on the ice happened. And, you know, that coaching that he was giving me on those car rides and, you know, that was so valuable to me and taught me pretty much everything I know about the game. So stuff like that. And, and as you mentioned, my father and, you know, where my father fits in is his ability to to become successful, 
but but remember that you always gotta gotta help. You, you always gotta look for who can you bring up. You know, it's not just about raising yourself; it's about raising all those around you. And, and so I appreciate that. Um, you know, Jerome McGinley is my favorite hockey player, and I've had the chance to now sit with him and meet with him many times. And one thing that he, that he always kind of pushed on me is just how you can be an absolute killer on the ice. You, you can be vicious, you, you know, you can be vicious on the ice, go out there with the mindset to be a winner and be a champion, but away from the rink, be a great guy, do the hospital visits, do all those things. So, you know, I try really hard to be a bit of a, you know, chameleon where I, I want to be cutthroat in competition and I want to just be the nicest guy I can be away from that. And, and so those are all, you know, great life lessons and, and stuff that's really helped me along the way. I think that's uh that's a lovely goal. It's interesting because we transition as we get older, right? We, we, we change from who we were and we adapt and we learn. Um, I think when you were in your young career and especially under uh, the captaincy uh, role, I think that you yourself, you know, sort of look back and said you were, you were energetic and boisterous and motivating. And, and, and I, I read something that said, you know, now all these years later, you're much more calmer. You, 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 you prefer to have conversations over, over coffee and explain to us sort of that transition because we do change. And I can tell you firsthand, I mean, I am remarkably different than I was, you know, 16 years ago when we started this company, I was also that, Oh my God, balls to the wall. It's like, like high energy, push, 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 push. And I really like where I'm at today. And I suspect based on what I read, you do. Yeah. And I think that for me, kind of, as, as we know nowadays, there's such a better love and understanding of mental health and what other people are going through. And I think myself in my early 20s was a guy that acted on emotion, was a guy that often would be hard on my teammates and, and trying to always push the buttons and get more out of people. And as I got older, you realize that not everybody responds to the same type of leadership and not everybody responds the same way to everything. And you got to have conversations because once you learn why somebody's doing what they're doing, it makes dealing with it a lot easier because because now you're coming from a place of understanding. Now you can help. But I think I went from somebody that was barking orders to somebody that wanted to understand. And once you be, I just think once you want to understand somebody's mindset, why they feel the way they feel, that's what puts you in a position to give advice. But you have to earn the respect. You have to earn the love and admiration. And if you don't put the work into earning someone's respect, you, you can never have an impact. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for uh, for sharing just such valuable insight today. Absolutely extraordinary. So, Greg, looking back now, um, how do you define leadership and, you know, all the experience you've had and you've, you obviously sound like a voracious reader as well. Sounds to me like personal development is, uh, is high on your priority list and congratulations for that. Um, how do you define leadership? Geez, you know, it's a, it's a great question. You, you know, I, I kind of gave my three bullet points earlier, but in terms of a definition, I, I just think it's, it, it's kind of, it's being bold. It, it's being willing to take those chances and, and take those risks because you know it's going to be worth it. And the thing about leadership too, it, it, it's about doing what's right. And you might not ever even see the fruits of that labor. You nice. know, for me right now, I work so hard in building our sport. I might never get the big corporate sponsorship, but the kid 10 years from now might. And, nice. and, and that's where it becomes something great. And, and that's where, you know, I touched on doing something bigger than yourself. T to me, I can't say it enough. That is my number one a pillar of leadership because you're going to make things better for yourself. You're going to make better for things better for people around you. And ultimately you're making a better community. You're making a better province. You're making a better Canada. And, mm. and so you can have those residual effects on all the people around you by just getting outside your comfort zone, taking some chances and doing the right things. Yeah. Yeah. Such uh, such words of wisdom at a, at a young age. Incredible. Uh, so, Greg, uh, last question, and then uh, I got some closing uh, comments and some things that I got to uh, feature to our uh, to our audience. But what are you most grateful for? Looking back, you've had an extraordinary career. Uh, you you've made lemon out of lemonade. Uh, you've been a exemplary leader. Uh, what are you most grateful for? Uh, I'm most grateful for opportunity. You know, I have great people around me and all that. We touched on that, but I, I think nobody should ever feel excluded. I think no matter what position, uh, no matter what family you're born into, no matter what position you find yourself in life, 
Uh, you need opportunity. And, and without opportunity, you have nothing. And I always have people around me that encourage me to get involved, encourage me to reach for more and, and try to be ambitious and, and, and do great things. And, and I just hope to cultivate um, an environment that encourages other people to do the same thing. I really liked early on uh, today, we talked about uh, inclusiveness and how important that is and, and don't get in the habit of going out with the same people. It's funny because just on a completely different you know scale, but you know, all the events that we do and, you know, I always say to my head office staff, please don't go sit with your, you know, someone you connect with, someone who you know really well or your favorite office owner, or, you know, like go with somebody else who's maybe sitting here and intimidated and, you know, first time, first event, you know, feels out of sorts. And you talked about that, you know, living that way in life and living that way. Uh, on the, on the, you know, on the, um, you know, in sports. So, so important. hundred percent, hundred percent. And, and they, that's one thing that sports does for you. They teach you that early just to, to mix and mingle. And, you know, the coaches are always watching. So from a young age, they're looking at who's moving table to table yeah. and, and not being click, clicky and stuff like that. So right. it, it plays a big part. Your brother told me earlier, uh, you're the kind of guy who wants no freebies. He wants, he says like the least victim mentality guy I've ever met. He goes, you know, we go out golfing. We love playing golf. And he said, you know, on prosthetics, he goes, you don't think you have, you don't have the the joint movement that you need for golf in your ankles and in your knees. So he says, whenever we're out playing, he said, lots of your friends will say, hey, Greg, you got a really bad lie there. You're on a downhill or an uphill lie. Move it to the flat. Like it's totally okay, bud. And apparently you just absolutely refuse it. You want no free rides. Yeah. Right? You, you, you got to learn how to hit those shots, right? Because you, you know, I want to compete in golf and I love playing in, in some local events and qualifiers and, and stuff like that. And I love doing the men's nights and the member guests. And at the end of the day, when I'm in those member guests, I'm not going to be able to move my ball and change my lies. So I got to learn how to hit those shots. So, <laughs> you know, Scotty and I have had a lot of great matches. We've had a couple, uh, couple arguments out there on the golf course and I'm sure we're going to have a couple more uh, in our yeah. lifetime, but uh, yeah, you know, at the end of the day, you got to think about, you know, in competition, what's going to, what's going to fly and what's not going to fly. So you got to play that way. Yeah. And I'll tell you, it obviously runs in the family because, and I want to give your bro a uh, shout out. Uh, when I first met Scotty right away, I thought, wow, this is a very passionate, dynamic, you know, young man, uh, extraordinary energy, um, you know, all, always looking on the bright side and he's the exact same thing. I mean, the apple doesn't fall far from his tree. It sounds like Pops was as well. Uh, he's built just an incredible mortgage company. His brokers absolutely love him. He grows year after year. Uh, and from a head office staff, head of office just absolutely adores him because he's just one of those great, nice, incredible guys. So uh, there's a shout out to Scotty. Scotty, we love you. We appreciate you. Greg, thank you today. Uh, I really enjoyed this. I mean, I've done a lot of these had some great guests. Uh, I really enjoyed having you on. Your fresh perspective, your humility, uh, your ambitious, your uh, so positive. I, I, I really believe the future is is bright. Um, you know, I hope more people get to hear uh, your story and 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 just the way you think because it is really inspiring. So, on behalf of the DLC group, on behalf of all of our viewers that you know see this on all the channels live streaming. Um, you know, I want you to know how, how appreciative and how grateful we are for having you. No, thank you. And thanks for all the comments and everybody who, who took time to just even just write a quick note. It's appreciated. And uh, Gary, all the best. And thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. And to our sponsor, First National, First Nap, guys, thank you. As always, extraordinary lender, extraordinary friends to the Canadian mortgage uh, space. I have some upcoming um, interviews coming up. Dave, what do I have? You want to put it on the screen for us? There we have Wednesday, April 13th. Uh, we have in conversation with uh, Dr. Sherry Cooper. Spoke to Sherry just last week. Wow. She has some very interesting uh, insights right now on, on the war, the inflation, um, you know, the rate hikes this year. It, it's just, it's um, more sort of topical now than I think it ever has. So we're looking forward to that. And David, one more, I believe. And then, oh, we're going to have, uh, yeah, we're going to have our CEO to CEO with uh, Paul Taylor coming up. Paul Taylor, president and CEO of uh, the association, obviously. Uh, great guy in the industry. Um, and I think there's actually a third, isn't there, Dave? There is. I'm sorry. Uh, Alan Keller. Looking forward to having uh, Alan on. Mental health advocate and best-selling uh, author. Um, very, very, very interesting individual. Uh, can't wait to have them on. So that's coming also, guys, Thursday, May 26th at the usual time, 11 o'clock. So with that, I want to sign off. We're going to send all of you that made comments, um, 
to um, a copy of the Phil Jackson 11 Rings book. Uh, Tara, please order one for myself. I can't wait to read it. And uh, thanks to all of you for tuning in. We had a great session today. Again, Greg, thank you. We'll, uh, we'll stay in touch and uh, take care, guys. Bye-bye.